I spent 10 years in Europe filming the cannabis industry. Uh, I made uh, digital videos uh, showing uh, farmers running their tractors on cannabis fuel back in the 90s. Um, and so, you know, just advancing uh, the awareness of cannabis as something other than, uh, you know, a smokable uh, yes. sport uh, was, was part of my mission. I, I, I like to tell people it's time to think of Hey guys, it's Mandy with Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. I'm excited about the opportunity to build a relationship and connect this supply chain. I mean, after all, that's why we started the association. Our association was built on the foundation of connecting supply chain, building relationships, and helping you grow your business. Anyone from farmers, manufacturers, and distributors, people that are passionate about the supply chain, and those creating products selling into biofuels, plastics, textiles, construction, and building materials. So welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. And thank you, Paul. I'm excited. Just yesterday, I actually had a guest on that was talking about the terpenes and how valuable they are and that, you know, the message was was misshot or we were miseducated or misinformed about some things. And so it was really interesting that she brought up the value of the terpenes. And I was so I'm excited to talk to you today. I'm excited that it just happened to lead in. But if you wouldn't mind real quick, Paul, give us an intro. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you came from, and how'd you get into this industry? I can't remember any of that. I woke up this morning and I completely couldn't remember anything I'd ever done. (laughs) Fair. (laughs) Lucky. I know. I'm really glad about it. Um, (laughs) Good thing I wrote a book. Um, Well, let's see. I am 65 years old. I uh, was born and raised in Northern California. Uh, I graduated from Humboldt State University in 1978 with a special major in art, wildlife, behavior, journalism with a minor in aviation. I am a commercial diver, an underwater photographer, uh, have been a freelance photographer for most of my adult life, and was the director for Sea Shepherd in Hawaii for uh, several years before I learned about cannabis and how you could make fuel from cannabis. And so as soon as I, I, I realized that you could make fuel from cannabis, I realized, well, that's a, a multi-trillion dollar industry. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so it became obvious to me that the, the real motivation for marijuana prohibition uh, was control of the energy production on this planet. Because when you reintroduce cannabis back into the equation, fossil fuels and nuclear energy and and really all other forms of energy become obsolete because of the environmental services associated with just growing the plant. And so I uh, learned about cannabis in 1991 uh, when I was director for Sea Shepherd. And I turned Sea Shepherd over to a friend of mine in Hawaii and founded Project Peace, which is an acronym which stands for Planet Ecology Advancing Conscious Energy or Conscious Evolution or Conscious Economics, depending on who you're talking with. Um, But it's an individual project. It's a lifelong project. I'm still director for Project Peace and have... Um, spent the last 30 years learning about cannabis and all dimensions of the industry, all dimensions of cultivation and uh, the environmental services in particular has been my main focus. And so um, I continue to uh, study and uh, um, teach people about cannabis and share uh, my own personal uh, journey with the plant um, from uh, several uh, sides of uh, relationship. I, I broke my neck in a hang glider crash in 1983, and I've, <laughs> I've never asked for permission to feel better. Um, I've challenged prohibition publicly by planting cannabis twice. Uh, first in 1992 in Hawaii, 
Uh, and then uh, in 1993, uh, in Sacramento, on the steps of the state capitol, and I have been convicted as a tax protester for refusing to give money to a government that puts people in jail for growing their own medicine, because taking an effective herbal therapeutic away from somebody who's in pain is no different than torturing somebody who's well. And I can testify to that firsthand because the residual neuralgia and muscle spasticity that I still to this day uh, suffer from is something that cannabis is uniquely effective and safe in mitigating. And so I challenge anyone's (laughs) rightful jurisdiction over something that is God given and has no uh, downside to it. In fact, um, you know, since cannabis was scheduled, uh, misscheduled, uh, it's been revealed that we have an endogenous cannabinoid system <laughs> that, that requires THC and the other cannabinoids to function properly. So the credibility of our, our governance is at stake and failing because it is obvious we're being manipulated. It's obvious that the world's most valuable agricultural resource is being suppressed uh, by the what? competitive market forces. What about some of the science we've talked about? You shared some of the science in, in some of your publications you know, around the terpene profile, right? That's not something that's talked about very often. Can you kind of give a breakdown about what is the terpene value in this plant and where do we really see an impact or what is not really being talked about? Or something I don't hear about very often is the terpenes and the effects it has on, which why wouldn't it? Terpenes are not just in cannabis, right? So, yeah, can you talk about the terpene profile and the value of that? Sure. I mean, that is a subject we could talk about all day. Yeah. Um, There are more and more uh, uses and values uh, um, being discovered all the time regarding terpenes. And as you pointed out, uh, cannabis is not the only plant that produces terpenes. In fact, many plants... uh, produce terpenes and and they are the aromatic uh, portion of a plant that you smell when you walk through a pine forest or when you uh, crush up some rosemary or um, basil. I mean, those are terpenes and uh, cannabis is unique in pr- producing an extraordinary volume of terpenes. Um, and in fact, Cannabis is um, in a very select group of plants that produces an extraordinary volume of terpenes. And the other plants in that group are uh, pine trees and the marine phytoplankton in the ocean. And the volume of terpenes is such that um, they actually play a role in reflecting solar radiation, the UVB radiation, away from the planet. And so the the greatest value of the terpenes is in shielding the Earth from solar UVB radiation, which is is broiling the planet. I coined a term global broiling, which I feel is uh, a much greater and more proximate threat to uh, earthly existence than the warming, because temperature increases related to the the UVB increase. And the UVB increase uh, has been monitored since the the late 70s and has shown to be increasing. It's that that data is not ambiguous at all. And so there's no debate, (laughs) there's no climate denial uh, associated with UVB increase um, because it's very uh, well documented and, and very pronounced. Uh, and, a, and a great threat. I mean, um, the terpenes have um, that function. They, they shield the, the earth from the sun. But um, it's important to understand that the, 
the boreal forests and the marine phytoplankton that used to produce uh, twice the volume of terpenes they do today, uh, half of those those trees and half of the phytoplankton are gone. Uh, just in the, the time that I've been alive, um, we've lost half of the boreal forests, mostly to produce paper, um, which could have been produced using hemp, which still can be produced using hemp, which needs to be produced using hemp. And um, we need to understand the, the relationships between the uh, terpenes which um, ascend up into the stratosphere and reflect the UVB, but they also serve as cloud condensation nuclei, which is very important because the, uh, the terpenes have antiviral, antifungal, antibiotic, antimicrobial properties that are built into the Earth's hydrologic cycle because the terpenes serve as cloud condensation nuclei. They become... Okay of the clouds and they don't photodegrade in sunlight. They uh, are uh, rained and snowed from the sky. And so the antimicrobial, antifungal, antiviral uh, properties of these terpenes are part of the water purification <laughs> process. But these are theories that I've presented in my book, Cannabis Versus Climate Change, which I just happen to have a copy of right here. Um, okay. And so, if people want to understand the theories that I introduce and the logic behind them, um, they can either uh, read my book or watch my film, which is on Vimeo by the same title, Cannabis Versus Climate Change, or um, they can go to my California Cannabis Ministry blog because um, I've also founded a ministry that recognizes the, the spiritual dimensions of agriculture. You know, our, our functional interface with the natural order comes through agriculture, where we uh, partner with nature to heal nature. Yeah. And that is really the only option for us at this point. Um, we, uh, we really need to recognize that, that time is the limiting factor in the equation of survival and that cannabis is uniquely qualified to do everything that needs to be done in, in the time that we may have left to make a difference. And that's really- Okay, so I wanna talk about that piece of it, right? Because this is something that, it was an aha moment for me. When I got in, um, I was actually at a CBD and cannabis event and it was just mind boggling to me that all of these problems that we have or are facing in such, um, at such rapid speed, right? Like our plastics, for example. Um, and here we had a substitute, if not all of it, but most of it, or probably not all of it, but most of it. And yet we haven't had access to this plant. And then I got into supply chain for food and clothing and manufacturing and rural and economic development and our housing and all of these different pieces. And now just recently working with Bruce, you know, the climate and the carbon, right? And so talk to me about volume or methods that, you know, would actually create a movement um, in the trajectory we have, right? For the ozone or for our atmosphere around camp well, around cannabis, involving cannabis first of all first of all i think it's important to to realize that if we couldn't make one thing out of cannabis if we couldn't use it for anything if we couldn't eat it or um build houses out of it or or anything else we still have to grow it for its environmental services the environmental services services that cannabis offers mankind are unique to cannabis and they're essential to our uh, regenerative uh, recovery of uh, homeostasis on this planet. Um, and so that's the main, the main message that I carry is that, um, yeah, you can make a lot of things out of cannabis, but the most important uh, function of the plant is in healing Earth's atmosphere, soil, water, air, and wildlife. It, it achieves all of those things in a, a unique 
uh, way that is essential for our recovery. So that's the main thing that I'm here to, to, to introduce. As far as um, the, 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 the function it plays creating um, material abundance on this planet, um, that also is, is extremely important because the economic disparity that we are currently uh, enmeshed and entangled in is uh, as great a threat to our existence as uh, climate change. But what's interesting about cannabis is that it grows in almost every soil and climate condition on the planet. And that's one of the things that makes it unique and essential to uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and uh, recovering uh, the damaged, uh, depleted, contaminated areas of the planet that um, cannabis can um, regenerate and uh, phytoremediate. And so um, those are the um, sort of <laughs> the, the, the most obvious um, functions for cannabis. But it's also important to understand that cannabis is the only crop that produces complete nutrition and clean energy from the same harvest. That's a huge, huge mm -hmm. thing to say because mm -hmm. it means that we don't have to choose between food security and energy security. Cannabis offers both as it heals Earth, atmosphere, <laughs> soil, water, air, and wildlife. So the, the current regulation of the industry is counterproductive to the quality of life for everyone's children. And we need to understand that there are uh, uh, protocols, emergency preparedness protocols, that accelerate our ability to access cannabis in a meaningful way in the time that we may have left to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I've introduced essential civilian demand as that accelerated federal protocol that has uh, uh, come into play because of the conditions that we face and the realization that we're facing imminent global extinction if we, if we don't uh, end our addiction to fossil fuels and and fight or remediate uh, the planet, expand the arable base. I mean, we can plant cannabis in virtually every country <laughs> in the world yeah. um, and, and people will be able to help themselves. You know, we, mm -hmm. we can give people the seeds and they can plant them and we can show them how to, to process the, the crop into uh, complete nutrition and sustainable clean energy and other products, uh, paper and cloth and uh, building materials and herbal therapeutics and uh, feed for, for humans and wildlife and fish and birds. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's a solution that is, um, it almost sounds too good to be true. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that makes it hard to to tell people about it because yeah. I've been called a fanatic on on Dutch national television because I uh, was telling people about all the things that can can do better than anything else. <laughs> and at one well, point, the, the, I have a question. One of our one of our guests has a question, Paul, and I'm curious as yes, well. Can you explain the homeostasis aspect a little bit more in depth? Explain the impact that cannabis can achieve or has to achieve it, please. Well, and the cannabis, impact that cannabis has to cannabis achieve it can can serve as the a foundation for Gaia therapeutic industry. Gaia therapeutic industry is another uh, uh, neologism that I introduced into uh, the language because. Gaia therapeutic industry is earth healing industry. And what that means is that you tie clean energy production to the healing of earth's atmosphere. <laughs> and so 
you go from gaiocidal energy in the form of fossil fuels and nuclear energy, um, and you transition to Gaia therapeutic energy, which is the cellulosic hydrogen and the methanol and uh, pyrolytic charcoal and um, other uh, I mean, diesel seed oil. Uh, and getting back to the terpenes, um, just recently there was an article published um, that identifies terpenes as uh, a feedstock for producing uh, jet fuel <laughs> and and mm -hmm. diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. So just another another use for terpenes aside from their therapeutic uh, value, you can you can ro uh, run your rocket on them. <laughs> or yeah, so I'm or curious. Say, about <laughs> and and where are they where are they extracted are they grown in a more uh cannabinoid like high cannabinoid profile plant or more in the fibrous like where are they being where is their yeah where are they harvested the most or what yeah well the the terpenes are um volatile and so right. um, that's why we can smell them, and that's why cannabis smells so uh, richly. Um, mm -hmm. But the uh, trichomes, where the resin is uh, produced, are rich in terpenes. terpenes. And the extraction yeah. method is uh, steam distillation, where um, 50 pounds of flour, 50, uh, is required to produce one ounce of cannabis essential oil so wow. it's it, yeah it's really really uh concentrated and yeah. uh quite quite therapeutic i mean the the therapeutic benefits of of cannabis terpenes <laughs> are um you know a whole nother uh book you know i mean it's just the therapeutic benefits of terpenes and in combination with the cannabinoids and also with the seed nutrition, when you uh, sure. incorporate all dimensions of healing from the plant uh, and make them available uh, simultaneously, then there is synergistic uh, benefit that some people refer to as the uh, entourage effect. Though I'm trying to uh, <laughs> update our... Uh, our uh, vernacular to include the, the orgy effect <laughs> of, of all the different sure. parts of the plants. Uh, the entourage effect refers to the terpenes, the cannabinoids and uh, flavonoids and other uh, portions of the flower. But um, when you incorporate the seed nutrition into the uh, cannabinoid and terpene therapies, then you uh, achieve a whole different level of healing. And um, and association in, uh, with a plant, so uh, it's whole plant nutrition. I think is is um, quite quite stunning. I, I started making uh, leche verde, which is a whole plant drink, um, back in 1997 when I was in Holland, and I think it reverses the degenerative aging process, actually. And um, is something that definitely needs to be to be uh, regarded and and looked into. In a whole plant, when you when it comes to the whole plant in general. Mm -hmm. the, is that what you mean? It's the yeah, uh, the the flowers, the male flowers. I I put them all into a blender with spring water and blend them up and strain them, and it comes oh. out looking like green milk. <laughs> so I call okay. it. And I uh, have been drinking it for years, and and I'm in as good uh, health as a person my age with my medical history can be. So um, sure. I can only, uh, you know, speak for my own uh, experience with it. I don't recommend it to anyone because I'm not a doctor, but sure. um, I am a Canada scholar, and so uh, I have used myself as a guinea pig for Leche Verde. And so far, you know, I've got all my digits and all my stuff works. Sure. <laughs> you know? Where's, tell me a little bit about your journey here, right? Throughout this process. What's, where, where have you 
tell me about the ups and downs of the industry and where you see real opportunity coming up. Well, the, the ups and downs of the industry over the trajectory of the last 30 years have been quite extreme. Um, yes. When I started doing this, um, you know, you could get a life sentence for, for, for cannabis uh, in, in some places. And yeah. um, now, uh, of course, you know, things are starting to change and, and people are, are being released from prison. So uh, that's one major uh, change that is in process but still needs to be uh, completed because there are still a lot of people in prison who don't deserve to be there. And it's just um, something that I feel needs to be uh, mentioned at every possible opportunity. We can't forget those people. Uh, yes. Even though we're enjoying cannabis freedom and we're able to, to advance into the 21st century, you know, there are a lot of people that are being left behind and their families are suffering. And, and so we do need to address that part of it uh, like a, a laser beam. I'm one of the founding members of Green Prisoners Release in Amsterdam in 1996 when I flew to Holland with a one-way ticket because I was fed up with the drug policy of the United States and I wanted to experience cannabis freedom. So I, I had to go to Europe to do it. And I spent 10, 10 years there filming the, the cannabis industry in Europe, which was light years ahead of where we were uh, back in the 90s. And so uh, I spent 10 years in Europe filming the cannabis industry. Uh, I made uh, digital videos uh, showing uh, farmers running their tractors on cannabis fuel back in the 90s. Um, and so, you know, just advancing uh, the awareness of cannabis as something other than, uh, you know, a smokable uh, yes. Euphoric. Uh, was was part of my mission. I, I, I like to tell people it's time to think outside the bong about cannabis because there are so many uh, uh, essential uh, um, properties of it. That, uh, anyone who's more concerned with THC than they are uh, with UVB oh, really is um, missing the 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 reality of the situation we're in. UVB radiation ex is extremely dangerous and deadly and has already uh, more than doubled in my lifetime. So yeah. um, it's important for people to understand that, um, you know, THC is part of our, uh, our proper health and development, whereas UVB is um, killing us literally. And, mm -hmm. and it's very, uh, hardly talked about. So, um, yes. you know, my, my development in this, um, in, in, in my role as a cannabis scholar really, um, has, um, branched out into, uh, many, many dimensions of the industry. Um, also my training, uh, as a, a financial, uh, consultant, I, I'm SEC qualified, or, or I was SEC qualified back in the 80s, um, working with the Equitable. And so I have an understanding of economics that uh, is a little bit deeper than a lot of people. Um, and my insights into cannabis and the value of it um, are complementary to that. And so in assessing the cannabis industry, I can tell you that um, the environmental services of it are currently the most undervalued and, and disregarded <laughs> uh, uh, dimensions of the cannabis industry because the carbon sequestration uh, value of the plant is being discussed, but um, the oxygen production and the terpene production value of cannabis uh, is something that is uh, of equal or greater importance and value even than the carbon sequestration uh, uh, value of the crop. And those, um, those co uh, economic considerations um, are part of overcoming the economic inertia that we were all born into. We, we were all born into cannabis prohibition. We've never known a truly free market economy because the world's most valuable agricultural resource has been out of reach. And so 
Um, we are currently in the process of overcoming that economic inertia that keeps us uh, uh, entrenched in uh, our addiction to fossil fuels and nuclear energy. But um, because of the nature of the cannabis plant uh, and the speed at which it is able to grow and thrive, um, we have the opportunity to uh, recover if we initiate a coordinated uh, cannabis campaign uh, in time, because time is the limiting factor in the equation of survival. We're, we're running out of time uh, more quickly than we realize. Uh, the, the ocean uh, ecosystem is collapsing as we speak. And um, mm -hmm. cannabis can, can play a very uh, vital uh, and essential role in, in uh, helping the oceans to recover. Uh, there's a lot, a, a lot to unpack there, but um, it definitely needs to be uh, on the table for discussion. Uh, because it's it's a, a current uh, threat to our existence. Mm -hmm. If the ocean ecosystem collapses, then then life on land will never uh, sure. be able to to, to uh, recover. We won't make it, right? Um, I want to say hi to a couple of people real quick, and then I want to talk a little bit about that plan. Like how how do we roll this out, right? Because this is something that that a lot of groups and it's more associations or more collaborative efforts are being put together around the globe, and it opens up legally um, <clears throat> the conversation about how hemp plays a role, and then now how do we roll that out, right? Um, so I want to say real quick that. <clears throat> Or highlight Michael. Michael said, think outside the bomb bong. Kathy loves it. She's going to use it. Think outside the bong. Um, <laughs> Michael as well. And then hello, Rick. I'm glad that you're joining today. Jeff, as always, if you're on still, hello. Um, yeah. So Paul, tell me a little bit about, about what, how do we roll this out? What's the volume that we need to be looking at across the globe in order when we talk about agriculture, right? How much do we need? And and, and what, what do you expect or what do you anticipate, you know, being the most efficient way to reverse some of the damage that we're doing or slow it down at the very least? Well, I, I think we can reverse it. I, mm -hmm. I think we still I have agree. time to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And the way that uh, seems uh, possible to me is, is in recognizing that cannabis produces um, several types of fuel. And the volume of cannabis that is required to heal Earth's atmosphere is an enormous volume of, <laughs> of cannabis. And so if we start there with healing Earth's atmosphere, because if we don't heal Earth's atmosphere, nothing else that we're doing will matter. And so uh, we begin with that. And so the volume of cannabis that's needed to heal Earth's atmosphere is about 7% of the surface of the planet. Um, and fortunately, uh, and, and the reason I say that is because the boreal forests uh, used to cover about 15% of the land area on the planet uh, at the northern latitudes. It encircled the, the northern regions of the planet, the subarctic regions. And, and the marine phytoplankton also uh, are about 50% depleted. And so um, if you figure that, um, you know, we need to replenish the atmosphere with uh, twice the volume as is being produced now, that will require about 7% of the Earth's uh, land area, approximately. You know, the, the truth is we need to plant as much cannabis as we can as fast as we can in as many soil and climate conditions to which it may be able to adapt and just pray it's not too late. Because how much to grow isn't really the question. The question is how much time do we have? Right, sure. And that okay. is the variable that we don't know. We don't know the answer to that question because there are uh, things uh, like nonlinear extinction level events that we've been warned about by the IPCC 
and uh, cascading systems failures, which are threatening to take us over uh, the falls, you know, to the where recovery isn't possible. And so the real question is, um, how fast can we plant cannabis and how much seed can we get in the ground uh, before it's too late to uh, recover? And so when you look at, at those uh, numbers, then what it does is it's a, it, it, it opens up the possibility of using all of that stem material <laughs> that is left over from healing the atmosphere um, to uh, producing cellulosic hydrogen because cellulosic hydrogen uh, biodigested from cannabis stalks is the most efficient way to turn sunlight into clean energy for the greatest number of people in the most countries around the world in the shortest span of time. And so when all of those things are taken into consideration, it's no longer a question of, well, how much should we plant? <laughs> it's, the question is, how fast can we plant all the seed that we have? Because right now, seed is the limiting factor in the uh, amount of cannabis that can be grown. And if you're not growing cannabis for seed, uh, then you're food insecure. And so if you are um, aware of the nutritional value of cannabis seed and you're aware of the energy uh, potential of the stems of the stalks, then you can see that um, we have the opportunity to make the transition in a much shorter span of time because of the, the properties of the plant, just the, the speed at which it grows, the number of countries in which it can be planted, and um, the volume of seed produced uh, by the plant so that we can increase our uh, seed stock and increase the, the number of acres that are planted. And I, I'm talking about planting cannabis in places where other plants won't grow and regenerating uh, depleted, damaged, eroded soils um, and feeding wildlife, not even necessarily harvesting the plant, allowing it to uh, serve as a non-invasive pioneer crop, which it, it, it is uh, uniquely qualified to do. So, um, you know, the, the, in the past, it was, it was uh, said that we need to study more. We need to uh, quantify uh, the, the volume of, of uh, products and, and uh, properties of the plant. But really, we don't have time for that anymore. Because if time is the limiting factor in the equation of survival, then all of the data that um, should have been <laughs> collected, you know, 30 years ago when I started doing this. Um, you know, that data really is secondary to just recognizing that we're running out of time. And I mean, it's pretty obvious to people that we are running out of time. And, um, you know, it's also pretty obvious to me what we need to do about it. But what is difficult is that there are what I refer to as climate solution deniers who um, are still suffering under the, the propaganda of, of the drug war. And so they uh, discount cannabis and they uh, dismiss it in, in spite of the science. <laughs> I mean, they, they just disregard it because they're conditioned to disregard the plant. And so even climate scientists like Michael Mann and, and, and uh, uh, others are um, are lax in their um, appreciation of uh, the fact that cannabis is mankind's functional interface with the natural order, and it has to be recognized that. Can you talk a little bit about the soil? We brought up like the soil and the root structure and how it's different, like. One thing that I hear often is because of its deep root structure, it can grow with less water, right? It remediates the soil. It allows it to um, 
long story short, basically increases yields on crops because of its root structure, right? Or on its rotation crop. Can you speak a little bit about some of those benefits? I mean, and I know that the like carbon sequestration is really good because of its root structure. Yeah. You know, the cannabis roots, again, it's one of the most under-regarded um, uh, parts of the plant and mm-hmm. uh, underappreciated for what it does. Um, the, the vast root structure of the cannabis plant makes it very efficient with water and okay. it uh, is able to uh, send a tap root down into the soil uh, to uh, access the moisture that is protected from the sun uh, just because it's deeper in, in the soil. Um, and in many places, of course, there's you know subterranean water that uh, the water table can be accessed by a plant with a deep taproot. Um, the, um, the part of the, the root structure that fascinates me is the interaction that the roots have with the microbes in the soil and mm-hmm. the moisture that is retained in the roots if they're left in the soil that creates uh, the microbiome that um, continues to sequester carbon uh, in the soil even after the plants have been cut because the microbiota you know, sequesters somewhere in the neighborhood of around, generally speaking, about three tons of carbon per acre per year, according to the Rodale Institute. So, you know, keeping that uh, microbiome healthy um, includes moisturizing the soil, particularly in conditions that we're currently facing where the soil is drying out. You know, the, the warming of the planet and the broiling by the UVB radiation is cooking the soil and and killing the microbiota in the soil, which is, you know, another feedback loop that exacerbates, um, you know, the conditions. And so the, those back loops um, are things that are often not considered in anticipating the speed at which um, conditions are changing. And that's why, you know, many scientists uh, make predictions that, turn out to, to be um, too optimistic um, because they don't really factor in the feedback loops associated with the conditions that are, are deteriorating. And so, so the soil um, uh, conditioning of the roots, also the, um, the, the uh, breaking up of compacted soils uh, is very critical to... <laughs> is very critical to um, uh, the regeneration of the soil and penetration of the moisture uh, to where it can uh, be protected against evaporation. Um, and also just the, the income stream that's offered by the roots. If people harvest the roots, uh, you know, that's another dimension of of the the crop that can uh provide uh medicine uh for people um and um, and also um provide for um other uh income streams that aren't currently being factored in you know, the, the volume of production makes a lot of these things possible. Um, the scale of production currently is a fraction of, of what it, it needs to be. And um, once you increase the scale of production, then a lot more possibilities uh, open up. And that scale of production, again, is, is, is uh, dictated by the need to, to heal our atmosphere and the unique properties of the cannabis plant that are capable of doing that. So it all goes back to the atmosphere. (laughs) 
Yeah, right. Well, and it's interesting, you know, when we talk about the like the X Prize, right? For example, you're starting to see these initiatives that are coming up to start the discussion, to get people thinking, to start coming up with some solutions. And yeah, it's amazing to me how many times hemp and cannabis fall right into those those discussions, right? Right into the solutions. Jeff had a question wondering if you'd looked at studies around higher levels of THC, 1% in federal hemp left over from old industrial hemp, giving the plants more resiliency to drought, pests, and pathogens, essentially breeding out the THC. Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the feral hemp is the most valuable uh, and the land race strains, the, the heirloom strains, whether they're left over from uh, you know, the, the crops that were planted in World War II, uh, you mm-hmm. know, more than 50 years ago, or uh, they're the ancient strains that have been grown for growing for thousands of years. Those um, strains have adapted to soil and climate conditions that um, we can expect are going to get worse in the future. Um, and so that adaptability is not something that you see in the hybrid strains. And that's what is really, really um, uh, another um, mistake that's being made in only allowing for the approved hybrid strains um, and patented strains. Those strains are inferior. And the, the reason that they're being developed is because of this obsolete notion that THC is bad for the human body. That what I referred to as the great lie of 1937. And so the feral strains and the land race strains need to be um, recognized for their uh, exceptional value. And the, currently in the Midwest, in the United States, and in other places in the world, the feral hemp and the land race uh, strains of hemp are, are currently producing seed. And that seed needs to be harvested <laughs> and planted and recognized for its superior value. The THC yeah. plays a, a role in protecting cannabis from pests and uh, fungal infections and th- things like that. And it also um, uh, provides synergist or uh, symbiotic benefit with uh, uh, insects, for example, mm-hmm. bees. Um, I have a film uh, that I have posted on my uh, Twitter page that shows a bee rubbing itself down from antenna to stinger with cannabis resin. And um, I've observed that for for years and thought that there was probably some antifungal or uh, anti-miticidal benefit to the the high THC, high uh, resin content of my marijuana plants that the bees were, were using, uh, to, to (laughs) protect themselves. And so, you know, mankind is far beyond its rightful authority in, in legislating scarcity of a unique and essential natural resource upon which other species also depend for their health, evolution, and survival. And so we need to recognize that our legislation is um, a violation of the natural rights of every species on this planet because we're all connected. All systems are connected. And we, we have to acknowledge that uh, before we arbitrarily remove a critical species from the natural order. It's just not right. <laughs> Well, and you see it more and more. It's kind of, you know, the more you bring this up, it just keeps coming up. And within this industry, it's, we really are passionate about the entire circle, not just what we're doing, right? But how it affects the front end and the back end, everything, everything involved. Um, Yes, I well, how can people remind remind people again for those that may weren't maybe weren't listening in the beginning? How do they find your book? Can you talk a little bit more? Where do you find your book, and how do people reach out to you, Paul? If people are looking to connect with you, well, I'm pretty easy to to get in touch with. Um, my book is available on Amazon. It's entitled "Cannabis Versus Climate Change," and um, there's also a film on Vimeo by the same title and there is also my California cannabis ministry blog 
you can just Google California Cannabis Ministry and my name, and, and it'll take you to my blog. Um, I have uh, a YouTube channel as well. Um, I have been participating in the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's uh, Food Security and Nutrition Summit uh, since 2002. And um, people can reach me by email at projectpeace at yahoo.com. And they can also awesome. find me on Twitter at Project Peace is my Twitter handle. And on Instagram, just by uh, searching for my name without my middle initial. Um, okay. So I'm very, very approachable. And, and I invite uh, people to recognize that, um, you know, there is no money on a burned out planet. And I currently have a, a crowdfunding uh, um campaign to try to raise a million dollars to build a biodigester at our farm in Southern Oregon, where we can biodigest cannabis stocks into cellulosic hydrogen that can then be used to turn a, a generator to produce electricity. Mm. And that is a, a, a model of clean energy production uh, combined with food production, because the uh, crop that would be planted would be planted to produce both seed for food and stocks for energy. And so, um, you know, there is uh, a potential to uh, replicate that project in every region uh, at every scale because um, the biodigestion process is a very <laughs> very, very straightforward, very basic process. It's essentially building a large mechanical stomach and putting microbes and enzymes into that uh, uh, contraption in order to digest the, the stem material, the cellulose material. And so um, it's something I'm, I'm raising money to build in Southern Oregon, but I'm also, also hoping that other people in other countries and other regions will will take my idea and, and make it their own because um, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, interest in hydrogen, particularly uh, these days, because it is such uh, an available uh, fuel for a, a large number of people. And that's the, the, the whole idea is to completely anim eliminate uh, the the dependence on fossil fuels and the subsidies that continue to prop up the fossil fuels industry. The, uh, those uh, treaties um, and those uh, uh, impacted uh, conditions need to be uh, recognized as functionally obsolete. And cannabis makes that possible because um, the nature's economy is based in abundance. Nature gives you more than you need, and um, it's only man that uh, limits nature's uh, abundance and so creates uh, an economic uh, economy of scarcity. And that's what we were born into, essentially um, institutional slavery, because we weren't allowed to grow our fuel, and we weren't allowed to grow our uh, protein from the ground. Um, and cannabis provides both of those things in abundance. And so it makes what I refer to as dolphin economics possible. You help me help you help everyone is the yeah. uh, economic model that uh, the dolphins uh, have, have taught us. And the biomimicry that you hear a lot uh, talked about these days needs to be applied to our uh, socioeconomic evolution as well and recognize that cannabis offers us abundance, an abundance of energy and abundance of food and abundance of all these other things that we can make from it. And um, it also offers us uh, the, the healing of the atmosphere, soil, water, air, and wildlife. So we right. just absolutely have to, to get on board with it. Did you see Kathy's question here? Do you have small models for off-grid homestead? She asked this right as you said that you're hoping that you take other people take this model and can use it in other places. Um, do you have available models? 
Okay. Absolutely. They're being they're being utilized all over the all over the, the planet right now um, in the form of uh, producing methane. Uh, people are using animal waste and um, and human waste and agricultural waste in places like China, where they build these uh, contained uh, essentially a mechanical stomach, and then they uh, just siphon off the farts. So um, the, the microbes that you introduce into the system will determine the, the product. And when you're using um, microbes that produce hydrogen, then you're producing uh, a cleaner fuel because, of course, the methane is, is uh, a greenhouse gas. But um, I also wanted to point out what you mentioned earlier is that our industry needs to um, take responsibility for our waste stream because currently uh, the cannabis industry is producing uh, quite a waste stream that's not being repurposed or responsibly uh, uh, um, addressed. And that's one of the things also that I think really needs to be um, regarded in terms of our ability to take the waste stream from uh, both the industrial hemp uh, industry and the recreational and medicinal uh, cannabis industry and process that waste stream into energy. And that's currently not being done. The, the stems from <laughs> the recreational uh, grows are just piling up in the fields and creating greenhouse gases. And so, you know, all of those things are really, really important to, uh, to, to look at. And, and once you look at them uh, in a coordinated way, it becomes really obvious what we need to do. Um, the, the people that are, are misdirecting our industry don't know anything about the, the things that, that I've been talking about today. And they don't yeah. want to know because it doesn't serve their purpose. And so we need to understand that um, we need to demand our access to cannabis. Um, Frederick Douglass said in, in 1857 that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And yeah. he was right. And what's controlling the cannabis industry right now is the great lie of 1937 that says THC is a danger mm -hmm. to the human body. And we need to understand that UVB is a danger to the human body and that cannabis and THC are the remedy for UVB. And so, you know, the relative threat to national security and global integrity is completely out of proportion. There is no threat to global security uh, posed by THC, but there's an enormous and very uh a serious threat uh, posed by UVB because one of the effects of UVB radiation is that it increases the solubility of mercury, arsenic, and selenium compounds out of aqueous solution. And so increasing UVB uh, threatens to toxify the, the entire hydrologic cycle of the planet just by increasing the solubility of mercury, arsenic, and selenium compound. And so you know, we really need to take this, this threat much more seriously than we are. I mean, COP26 in November uh, it hasn't even allowed uh, hemp uh, to be introduced as a solution to global warming. And so, um, you know, it's ridiculous to think that we can fix what's broken without using everything that we have at our disposal uh, to achieve the desired outcome. So. Right. Well, let's let's continue this conversation. You know, we've got lots of these. I've appreciated you on our other calls and giving your feedback and really, really talking. My goal is to help connect the dots and bridge this gap um, by giving a platform to really start talking about it. Thank you, Kathy and Daryl and Jay. Uh, Don for joining today, Jeff. Um, if for those of you that are logged on, please say hello. You can find the full videos um, for our interviews on our YouTube channel and on Patreon.
Patreon, Global Hemp Association. And then, Paul, um, we have another meeting after this at one, nope, two o'clock today, Mountain Time, 2 p.m. Mountain Time um, for a blockchain discussion to talk about how it also plays a big role in solving a lot of these problems and a lot of the um, track and trace, especially around the carbon footprint, right? And so I'm really excited to have everybody involved, excited to have you here. Um, please find any future information or any of our events are listed on our website at globalhubassociation.org. Other than that, Paul, we'll go ahead and edit this record. It is recorded. We'll edit it and then share it with you so you can also use it as you wish. And anybody else, please, if you need any help contacting Paul, please reach out or um, reach out to myself or anybody else within our organization. We'll help make connections as well. Thank you very much. We'll see you later, Paul. Thank you for your hour with us. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's great to have you. I've loved getting to know you. I'm excited to continue to share what you're working on. I think it's a valuable piece that's just not being not being talked about a lot. There's, It's just you're very far advanced when it comes to the cannabis. Some people are still trying to figure out if hemp gets you high. <laughs> well, you know, Mandy, I always like to say that it takes a head to get ahead. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for being that. Thank you for doing it. I really appreciate you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you too. We'll see everybody later then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.